All right, let's get right into it. Your assigned problems may or may not have different randomized values. For best results, attempt the assignment on your own before watching these solutions. Students are encouraged to frequently pause the video to work out steps on their own before proceeding with the solutions. And here's the list of topics to be covered in this video. In problem one, we're asked to evaluate the log base 10, otherwise known as the common logarithm, of 1 over 10,000. So remember that a logarithmic equation like log base b of x equals y is by definition a way of rewriting an exponential expression b to the y is equal to x. Exponential functions are one to one, meaning if you have the same base raised to two powers and the result is equal, those powers were actually equal to begin with. So we set our desired expression log base 10 of one over 10,000 equal to y, and now we'll convert it to the equivalent exponential expression 10 to the y is equal to one over 10,000. 1 over 10,000 is 1 over 10 to the 4th, otherwise known as 10 to the minus 4th. So we have 10 raised to the y is equal to 10 raised to the minus 4. Because exponential functions are 1 to 1, y is equal to negative 4. Problem 2, evaluate the log base 2, otherwise known as the binary logarithm of 8. So we set the log base 2 of 8 equal to y. Convert it to its exponential form, 2 to the y is equal to 8. 8 is 2 cubed, therefore y is equal to 3. In problem three, evaluate the logarithm base four of one over 16. So we set our expression equal to y and convert it to an exponential expression. Four to the y is equal to one over 16. One over 16 is of course one over four squared, otherwise known as four to the minus two. Since four to the y equals four to the minus two, y is equal to minus two. Simplify the log base four of one over four. So we set our expression equal to y, we convert it to its equivalent exponential form, 1 over 4 is 4 to the minus 1, since 4 to the y equals 4 to the minus 1, y must equal negative 1. In problem 5, we'll be evaluating four different expressions. First, the natural log of e to the minus 11, e to the natural log of 4, e to the natural log of root 3, and the natural log of 1 over e to the fifth. Now remember, natural log of x means the logarithm base e. Please do not say line x. If one fewer student says line x in place of natural log, then this whole series of videos will have been worth it. So for part a, we'll set the natural log of e to the minus 11th equal to y. This is a logarithm of base e, so we'll convert it to an exponential expression, e to the y equals e to the minus 11th. In other words, y is equal to minus 11. For b, we'll set e to the natural log of 4 equal to y. Now we're going to convert this into a logarithm of base e. In other words, the log of y should be that exponent log of 4. Logarithms are also 1 to 1, so y is equal to 4. For the third, we set e to the natural log of root 3 equal to y. We'll convert this to a logarithm, the base is e, so the log of y is equal to log of root 3. In other words, y is equal to root 3. For part 4, the natural log of 1 over e to the fifth is equal to y. We'll convert this to an exponential. 1 over e to the fifth is equal to e to the y. In other words, e to the minus 5 is equal to e to the y, or y is equal to minus 5. Now, in general, the logarithm base b of b to the x is equal to x, and b to the logarithm base b of x is equal to x. And that's really all the work we did four times, was going back and forth between these two expressions. And from this point forward, we're just going to take this as something we know. The logarithm base b of b to the x is equal to x, and b to the logarithm base b of x is equal to x. In problem six, we'll be evaluating several expressions again. First up, the log base two of two to the 13th, as just discussed, the log base b of b to the x is just x, so the log base 2 of 2 to the 13 is just 13. What about the log base 2 of 8? Well, 8 is 2 cubed, so we have the log base 2 of 2 cubed, that's 3. The log base 5 of 625, 625 happens to be 5 to the 4th, so the log base 5 of 5 to the 4th is 4. And what about the log base 3 of 3 to the 10th? We again just have the log base b of b to a power, so that power is the answer. Problem seven, using a calculator, calculate and round to four decimal places the logarithm base five of 24. Now this is just gonna depend on your calculator or computer software. One thing I would say before we just plug and chug is that the logarithm base five of 25 is two and the logarithm base five of five is one. Exponential functions with bases larger than one are increasing and therefore so are their inverses logarithms with bases larger than one. So 24 lies in between five and 25, which means the log base five of 24 will lie in between the log base five of five, which is one, and the log base five of 25, which is two. 
And since 24 is significantly closer to 25 than it is to 5, we should expect the result to be pretty close to 2, though just smaller than it. And if we simply plug this into a computer, we end up with 1.9746. It keeps going after that point, but here it is, rounded to four decimal places as requested. Problem 8. Simplify this expression into a single logarithm. 2 times the logarithm of 6 minus 1 times the logarithm of 10. We're actually given five options, we just need to determine which one is correct. This is a common logarithm because the base is not given, so it's taken to be in base 10, but that's not really important. Here are our basic properties of logarithms, that the log of one number plus the log of another is equal to the log of the product, provided the bases are all the same. The log of a number minus the log of another is the log of the quotient, provided the bases are all the same. And the logarithm of a number to a power, you can bring that power out as a scalar multiple. So, we have this scalar multiple 2 times log of 6 and 1 times log of x. Those are scalar multiples. Since we're trying to combine this into a single logarithm, we're going to bring those in as exponents. So we have the logarithm of 6 squared minus the logarithm of x to the first. As this is a difference of logarithms, we can express it as a quotient. The logarithm of 6 squared over x to the first, which is exactly option C. In problem 9, we'll have a list of expressions and we're going to determine which are equivalent to the logarithm base b of 4. Here are the five expressions we're going to check, and here are the basic properties of logarithms from the previous slide. So in part a, we have a scalar multiple of negative 1 times the log base b of a quarter. We can bring that inside the logarithm as an exponent, and then we have the log base b of 1 quarter to the minus first power, but that's just 4. So overall, we do indeed get the logarithm base b of 4. In b, we have a scalar multiple of 1 third, which we can bring in as a power, the logarithm base b of 64 to the 1 third, and 64 to the 1 third power is exactly equal to 4. So this is also equal to the log base b of 4. In part c, our scalar multiple of 1 half can be brought in as a power of 1 half, the log base b of 16 to the 1 half power, otherwise known as the square root of 16, which is also 4. In D, we have a difference of two logarithms, which we rewrite as a logarithm of a quotient, the log base b of 24 over 6, which is also the log base b of 4. And in E, we have the sum of two logarithms, which we can express as the logarithm of a product. So we end up with the logarithm base b of 1 tenth times 40, which is also the log base b of 4. Every single expression here is exactly equal to the log base b of 4. In problem 10, much like the previous problem, we'll be looking at a list of expressions and determining which are equivalent to 7 times the logarithm of u to the minus 1 half power. We do get to assume that u is positive. Here are the five expressions we need to check, and here are the basic properties of logarithms copied yet again. So let's turn our attention to part A. We have 1 over u to the 7 halves inside parentheses, which can be rewritten as u to the minus 7 halves. Now, as it happens, minus 7 halves is the same thing as negative 1 half times 7. So we can write u to the minus 7 halves as u to the minus 1 half all raised to the 7th. Now we have a logarithm of something in parentheses all raised to the 7th, and the 7 can be brought out as a scalar multiple. Therefore, we do end up with 7 times the logarithm of u to the minus 1 half. In b, we have negative 1 half times the logarithm of u to the 7th. We can bring that scalar multiple of negative 1 half inside as a power. We end up with the logarithm of u to the 7th, all raised to the minus 1 half, which resolves as the logarithm of u to the minus 7 over 2. Observe we've already seen this expression when we worked out part a, which we already know is indeed equivalent to 7 times the logarithm of u to the minus 1 half. Looking at part c, we've got this scalar multiple of negative 1. We bring it inside as a power, so we have the logarithm of u to the 7 halves all raised to the minus 1, otherwise known as the logarithm of u to the minus 7 halves power, which is an expression we've seen before, and therefore this is also equivalent to 7 times the logarithm of u to the minus 1 half. In D, we bring in this scalar multiple of negative 7 halves as a power. We get the logarithm of u to the minus 7 halves yet again, which we already know will be equivalent to 7 times the logarithm of u to the minus 1 half. Finally, in part e, we have the logarithm of 1 over the square root of u to the 7th. If I convert that radical to a rational exponent, we end up with 1 over u to the 7 halves, or the logarithm of u to the minus 7 halves, which, surprise, surprise, is the same thing as 7 times the logarithm of u to the minus 1 half, because we've worked it out before. So all of them are equal to 7 times the logarithm of u to the minus 1 half. Problem 11. 
Let's simplify this to a logarithm with a coefficient of 1. We have the logarithm base 5 of x to the 7th minus the logarithm base 5 of x to the 8th. Here are the properties of logarithms again. This is, however, the last time I'm going to copy and paste it from problem to problem. Past this point, we should just know them. First, we have a difference of two logarithms, so we'll write that as a quotient, the logarithm base 5 of x to the 7th over x to the 8th. This is now a single logarithm with a coefficient of 1, so technically I think we're done, but uh, let's just presume that we were expected to simplify this a little bit further, and we can write it as the log base 5 of 1 over x. Once again, simplify to a single logarithm with a coefficient of 1 outside. We have the log base 3 of 11x to the 6th plus the log base 3 of 6x to the 7th. The sum of two logarithms with the same base will be the logarithm of the product 11x to the 6th times 6x to the 7th. 6 times 11 is 66. x to the 6th times x to the 7th is x to the 13th. And here we have it, a single logarithm with a coefficient of 1. We're done. In problem 13, we're asked to write the following sum as a single logarithm. We can presume all variables are positive. We have the log base 3 of y plus the log base 3 of y plus 5. Since we have two logarithms of the same base that are being added together, we can express that as a product. Lo and behold, we have a single logarithm. That's all there is to do. Problem 14, write the following as the sum and or difference of logarithms. Assume all variables are positive. We have the common logarithm of 9y over 7. The wording of this problem is really quite ambiguous. Uh, we already have a sum and or difference of logarithms. It's a sum with a single term. So one could argue that you're done. But I think we all know what the problem is really asking of us, so let's just work through it. Since we have the logarithm of a quotient, we can break that up as a difference. Now we have the log of 9y. That's the logarithm of a product, which we can break up as a sum. Problem 15. Write the expression logarithm of x to the 15th times y to the 20th divided by z to the 7th as a sum and or difference of logarithms with no exponents, by which it means the terms inside the logarithms should not have exponents on them. Or rather, the exponent should be 1. First, we have the logarithm of a quotient. We're going to split that up as a difference. Now our left term was actually a product. We'll split that up as a sum. Each of these is now the logarithm of a single number to a power. All of those powers can come out as scalar multiples. And here we have three different logarithms, a sum and or difference of them. And what we're taking the logarithm of all have exponents of one. Problem 16, we've got this expression, the natural log of r to the fourth, s to the 10th, the 10th root of r to the seventh, s to the fourth is equal to some multiple of the natural log of r plus some other multiple of the natural log of s, and we have to determine what those multiples are. So here we have our original expression, but the tenth root replaced with an exponent of 1 over 10. I'm going to distribute that exponent across the r to the 7th and s to the 4th to which it applies. I have r to the 4th and r to the 7 tenth. I'm going to add those two exponents together. Similarly, s to the 10th and s to the 4 over 10, I'm going to add those exponents together. After simplifying some fractions, we have the natural log of r to the 47 over 10 times s to the 52 over 2. This is the logarithm of a product. We can break it up as a sum. Then those exponents can be brought out as scalar multiples. So what multiple of log r did we have? That was a, 47 over 10. And what was the scalar multiple in front of the log of s? 52 over 5. Problem 17, given that the natural log of a is 2, the natural log of b is 3, and the natural log of c is 5, we're going to evaluate four different expressions, beginning with the natural log of a to the first over b squared times c cubed. Well, since we have the log of one number divided by another, that can be written as a difference of two logarithms. On the left, the logarithm of a to the first, since I just have the logarithm of one number to a power, that power can be brought out as a scalar multiple. On the right, we have the natural log of b squared times c cubed. That's the log of a product. It can be replaced with the log of a sum. Be careful, however, that this sum of logarithms does have a minus 1 that will end up being distributed across that entire expression. Inside the parentheses, however, we now have the log of b squared plus the log of c cubed. We can bring those exponents out as scalar multiples, distribute the minus 1. Now we'll replace the known values of the natural log of a, b, and c respectively, computing a result of negative 19. Next, we have the natural log of the square root of b to the minus 3 times c to the minus 1 times a to the minus 1. I don't like radicals. I'm going to write that as an exponent of 1 half. One viable approach would be to say we now have the natural log of something to the 1 half, meaning the 1 half can be brought out as a scalar multiple. It's not the direction I went. Inside parentheses, I distribute that 1 half to each term. 
And now what we have is the logarithm of one number times another times a third, those three numbers being respectively b to the minus 3 halves, c to the minus 1 half, and a to the minus 1 half. Since we now have the logarithm of a product, we can break that up as a sum of different logarithms. Each of these now is the logarithm of a number to a power, so those powers can be brought out as scalar multiples. We can now replace the known values of natural log a, b, and c with their values, computing a result of negative 8. Third, we have the natural log of a to the minus 1, b to the minus 3, divided by the natural log of bc to the minus 4. So up in the numerator, I've taken the natural log of a to the minus 1 times b to the minus 3 and broken it up as the sum of two logarithms, the natural log of a to the minus 1 plus the natural log of b to the minus 3. Down in the denominator, we had the natural log of something to the minus 4. I brought that out as a scalar multiple. Up in the numerator, those two exponents, a to the minus 1, b to the minus 3, those exponents are brought out as scalar multiples. Down in the denominator, leaving the negative 4 alone for now, the natural log of bc I've replaced with natural log b plus natural log c, but be careful that the minus 4 will distribute across that sum. Since we now, however, have simply natural log a, natural log b, natural log c appearing, I can replace those with a known value, simplifies down to 11 over 32. In part d, we have the natural log of c to the fourth times the natural log of a over b to the minus 2, all raised to the minus 4 power. So the first thing I've done, in the left term, we have the natural log of c to the fourth, so we bring that power of 4 out as a scalar multiple. In the right term, we had the log of a divided by b to the minus 2. I've replaced that with the natural log of a minus the natural log of b to the minus 2. Inside those parentheses, since we had the natural log of b to the minus 2, I've taken that exponent and brought it out as a scalar multiple. Now the natural log of c, the natural log of a, and the natural log of b are all known values, so we can replace them. That parenthetical term of 2 plus 2 times 3 all raised to the minus 4 power is a little unpleasant. 8 to the minus 4 power is a large number. We end up with 20 divided by 4096, but that does simplify marginally to 5 over 1024. For problem 18, we have the function y is equal to the logarithm base 2 of 1 plus 6x. The first thing we're asked is, what's the domain of this function? In other words, which x can be plugged in? Meaning, for which x does there exist a y that solves y equals the log base 2 of 1 plus 6x? We could convert this to an exponential expression. For which x is there a y so that 2 to the y is equal to 1 plus 6x? Now, that exponential 2 to the y has a range of all positive numbers. Meaning, provided 1 plus 6x is a positive number, there will be such a y. We can solve this for x and see that x must be larger than negative 1 sixth. Note, by the way, that in general, the domain of a logarithm is the thing being plugged in must be positive, which we found second line from the end here that 1 plus 6x must be positive. The second thing we're asked is, what's the range? Well, the range of a logarithm typically will be all real numbers, provided that the domain is not restricted. We know this, by the way, because logarithms are inverses of exponentials, and the domain of an exponential is all real numbers, which means that the range of its inverse is all real numbers. So, can we solve the logarithm base 2 of 1 plus 6x equals y for x, meaning 2 to the y is equal to 1 plus 6x, or x is 2 to the y minus 1 over 6? Yes, we were able to solve for x without issue. So regardless of y, this value of x can be found, meaning for any desired output, there will be a corresponding input. So all real numbers are in the range. For problem 19, the equation y equals logarithm of x plus 5 has a vertical asymptote where? Now in general, the equation y equals log base b of x has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. It's the inverse function of an exponential. Exponentials have horizontal asymptotes at y equals 0 by default, meaning that logarithms by default have vertical asymptotes at x equals 0. However, it has been shifted 5 units to the left. We don't simply have log x, we have the log of x plus 5. So if everything is shifted 5 units to the left, instead of the vertical asymptote being at x equals 0, it's at x equals negative 5. Problem 20, what's the vertical asymptote of f of x equals the logarithm of x minus 5? So this is simply a logarithm shifted 5 units to the right, so instead of the vertical asymptote being at x equals 0, it's 5 units to the right at x equals 5. Problem 21 is another problem where we have to match functions to graphs, so here everything is. Note, however, that in our graph there are no numbers on any of our axes. Now, if you have the graph of a function f of x, the inverse function f inverse of x will simply be the same curve but reflected across the line y equals x. So even though our axes do not have any labels, y equals x is easy to draw. 
Of the two exponential curves, e to the x and 10 to the x, 10 is a larger base, so it is increasing faster. So 10 to the x must be the blue curve. e to the x has the smaller base, so of the two exponential curves, it is increasing slower, it must be the green curve. Now we're going to ask, log base 10 of x is the inverse function of 10 to the x. So look over at the graph of 10 to the x, the blue curve, and attempt to reflect it across the dashed line. Since the blue curve is going up quite quickly and is further away from the orange line than the green curve on the right, when we reflect it across the orange line, the same thing will be true. Its reflection will be further away on the right from the orange curve. So that is the black curve. The blue curve is going up faster. Its reflection or its inverse is going up slower. Similarly, when we reflect the green curve across our dashed line, we end up with the red one. Problem 22, once again, is going to be match functions to graphs. Now, we could look at some qualitative information, like which bases are larger than one or less than one and have or haven't been vertically reflected. But while that's typically how I do it, here I think it's going to be quite quick to do this quantitatively to simply compute some points and see where the graphs go because our axes are labeled. So the log base three of three is one. So for option B, if we let X equal three, we know we're gonna get out a result overall of minus one. There's only one curve that goes through the point three minus one, it's this one in the bottom right. So there's B. Looking at C, the log base four of X, since log base four of four is one, it will go through the point four comma one, and there's only one curve that does that. The upper right is C. Log base one-fifth of five will be minus one, since five is one-fifth to the minus one after all. So plugging in x equals five will result overall in a one, because this log base one-fifth was being multiplied by minus one. So we're looking for a graph that has the point five, one. There's only one option here in the lower left, there's a, which leaves d to be the upper left, but let's just be clear. The log base one-fifth of five is minus one, so it needs to contain the point five minus one, and it does, there it is upper left is D. For our final problem in this problem set, we are asked to write an equation for the transformed logarithm with the graph below. We are told it passes through the points negative two zero and zero minus two, and while not spelled out in the wording of the problem, the picture accompanying does indicate a vertical asymptote at x equals minus three. So, here is the most general form that our logarithm could take. We have a logarithm base b, we don't know what the base is, this scalar multiple on the left a accounts for possible vertical stretching, including a reflection across the x-axis when a is negative. C accounts for horizontal stretching, including a possible reflection across the y-axis if C were negative. D and E respectively account for horizontal and vertical shifts. So for a logarithm, there are four ways we could transform it. And we also have an unknown base, so there are a lot of unknowns here to figure out. Thanks to properties of logarithms, however, looking inside, we have that c times x minus d. Since that would then be a logarithm of a product, it could split up as a sum of two logarithms. We would end up with the constant coming out of a times the logarithm base b of c, which would then be absorbed into the vertical shift of e. So between the constants c and e, you can ignore one of them. A horizontal stretching of a logarithm is the same thing as a vertical shift. So we're going to ignore c. So there we have it, we're ignoring c. Similarly, from a change of base formula, we could change the base of our logarithm log base b of x minus d to log base b prime of x minus d divided by the log base b prime of b. Then that constant log base b prime of b could be absorbed into the scalar multiple of a. So if we change that scalar multiple, we can make the base whatever we want, or by changing the base, we can make the scalar multiple whatever we want. We can account for vertical stretching through capital A, or we can account for the base being unknown, but there's no need to include both. We're going to elect to leave the base unknown and presume that A is one. Great, so both A and C have been ignored. In other words, we simply have a horizontal shift, a vertical shift, and an unknown base. The vertical asymptote at x equals minus three explicitly tells us we have shifted three units to the left as logarithms typically have their asymptote at x equals zero. So d must be negative three, so we have the log base b of x plus three 
plus e. Now the log base b of 1 is always 0. Therefore, negative 2 comma 0 being one of the given points on the curve tells us that the log base b of negative 2 plus 3 plus e should equal 0. In other words, the log base b of 1 plus e should equal 0, but the log base b of 1 is 0, so e is 0. So, so far, we've done a whole bunch of work, and our unknown curve is now written as the logarithm base b of x plus 3. There's only one more unknown, the base. So we have f of x is a logarithm of an unknown base of x plus 3, and to determine that base, we'll use the other given point, that if you plug in x equals 0, you should get out y equals negative 2. So negative 2 is the log base b of 3. In other words, b to the minus 2 power is equal to 3, which gives us that b is 1 over the square root of 3. So one possible solution here is that f of x is the logarithm whose base is 1 over root 3 of the quantity x plus 3. There are other equivalent solutions, by the way, by changing the base, for example, to not be 1 over root 3, but root 3, you could end up with a minus out in front, etc. So there are other correct solutions, but observe the wording of the problem. Write an equation, not the.